First, I would like to welcome everybody to today's Zoom uh, on Beverly Pepper for our exhibition, Precarious Balance. We're really thrilled to have Joy Graham, who's the daughter of Beverly Pepper, the executor of the estate, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning poet, dear friend, uh, Phyllis Tuckman, also a great friend of Beverly Pepper, one of the world's leading experts on the artist, uh, the prolific writer, art goer. Um, I'd like to ask everybody to please mute yourselves, those who are viewing. And um, we're gonna be starting, you're looking at a picture of the main gallery at James Barron Art, the upper gallery, with this installation, which I must say, whenever I walk in, it literally gives me goosebumps. It's as though you're feeling the entire presence of the artist from a piece from 1960 to 63, stainless in 68, right through the end. It's like you're looking at a lifetime. So without any further ado, Phyllis, I believe you're gonna be reading something. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. Sure. Uh, welcome everyone. We have the wonderful opportunity today to look at a group of remarkable sculptures by Beverly Pepper, replete with a backdrop provided by mother nature. I don't know about you, but at the moment, I'm looking at a lot of brick buildings. After running a short video made at the show, I'm going to make a few remarks about the artist and then talk about individual sculptures. Jory may add a thing or two along the way, then the two of us will discuss her mom's career. So can we have the, the video? I'd briefly like to say a few things about my friend Beverly that often don't get mentioned. For one, being based in Toady, which became known as Beverly's Hills, brought a unique quality to her body of work. Pepper made art in a setting where she was very conscious of the past, antiquity, medieval times, the Renaissance, as well as the Baroque periods. In other words, she knew a thing or two about crenellated towers. This is generally described as living history. In 1981, I referred to her then recent works as archeological minimalism. She liked that term and brought it up several times over the years. Her literal distance from the centers of minimalism brought a twist to her work. We'll see that in a minute. Also, Beverly thought in two languages. She could have an animated conversation in English or Italian. More broadly, she expressed herself verbally as well as visually. Then there was the matter of the sizes of her sculpture. They come in small, medium, large, and very large. Think about this. It's unusual to say the least. And this resulted from her being a contemporary artist based in Italy. So we're gonna start with this wonderful untitled piece. I'm intrigued uh, that it's uh, chestnut with bronze. Um, that it's womb-like, it's at the very beginning. Beverly had a very interesting moment when she decided to become a sculptor. She'd been a painter and 
very much as if she was illustrating Vasari's lives. If you're used to Vasari's lives, you know, I think it's like little Giotto is drawing with a stick from a tree um, in the dirt when he's discovered. Beverly went with Jory to Anger Watt and just was fascinated by all the gnarled, um, all the gnarled roots, the overgrown um, uh, temples, the trees. And if I'm correct, she went back and found all of these felled trees in her backyard and she became a sculptor. Now, if that isn't a typical story straight out of Vasari, I don't know what is. I'm kind of intrigued by this. I'm familiar with Herbert Ferber's works of the 30s when he was working with all sorts of different woods. And she begins in a, in a, in a place where a lot of sculptors had already been. I mean, if you think about 1960s uh, New York, it's the early, the days of early minimalism when actually Andre Flavin, Judd Lewitt and Morris are all working with wood, with wood boards. But Beverly is sculpting. She initially sees her role as a sculptor um, using different kind of tools, not fabrication shops. And this is um, like a concomitant of her being in Europe. I'm fascinated by these works because Beverly had um, gone to Spoleto. She was familiar with David Smith's work. And these are bands of metal and see-through and loops and where you might expect something figurative, she immediately plugs into this notion of abstraction and an abstraction with mixed materials. Um, the other thing that I find fascinating about these work is that she was, she started small. Why should she work big? She's teaching herself how to make uh, three-dimensional work. Before we leave these two sculptures, I just wanna point out something that's so obvious. We see through them. Something that is kind of astonishing at that moment in the art world. Can we have the next? So Beverly makes uh, a group of works that are among my favorites. There's one out on uh, the lawn in Buffalo. Uh, when the new building opens, I hope it's still there. There's another one in the sculpture park in Seattle. And these are, as you can see, small and large. Uh, tabletop and person size. I was kind of intrigued in uh, reading over some of this material the other day that the work on the right, she saw it, she saw the, the stainless steel as something empty. It was, it was reflecting the surroundings and in that it took you away from the individual sculpture. And then if you look at the bottom on the left, she felt that those interiors, which actually were empty, were filled. And that's a very interesting contradiction. If you look at these works, 1968, this is the height of minimalism. These are geometric, but they're not squares. They're not circles. They're not triangles. Beverly is going her own way. And uh, using 
a language of geometry, but not the geometry that other artists in America are using. I mean, look at this piece. Is this or is this not a kind of reflection by a mature artist of Carl Andre's floor plate pieces? done to such different effect. Um, uh, uh, squares, they're on the ground, they're reflecting um, the sky. I'm always amazed by pieces like this because when they stay outside, they also reflect the time of day, sunrise, sunset, sun, rain, and they reflect winter, spring, summer, and fall. And you don't think of many sculptures being capable of achieving that. I also totally love these stainless pieces. May I have the next, please? And here she inserts color. And this was an interesting no-no that she had the chrome plate and the enameled steel. And what an astonishing composition. And it's a very animated piece as if it were a ladder to heaven. And again, if you remember the, 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 the second group of sculptures, a work we see through. Can I have the next please? When I look at these, these sculptures, I'm always intrigued because they remind me of pickup sticks. They remind me of fences in, in uh, New England landscapes that need to be fixed. They are upright and yet falling down. And they do something we don't I, I, uh, identify with sculpture. They're not vertical, they're not horizontal, they're diagonal. And it is very rare to find diagonals in sculpture. Again, a work we're looking through and a work very comfortable in sculpture. And I've always been amazed at how Beverly Pepper's work, when it's seen outdoors, does not compete with mother nature. It blends in in a very, very beautiful way. I remember when my parents years ago bought two sculptures from a friend of mine and they went in the backyard. You know what? Sculpture belongs in a backyard. Can we have the next please? And these are small little gems that are absolutely astonishing. They're, uh, they, 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 were, they, they took off from tools that Beverly Pepper had. And again, they're vertical works. They're totally abstract. We don't associate them with figures and I remember years ago, I had an editor who was explaining to me, if a sculptor works with a horizontal, it's a landscape, a vertical is a figure. Well, this is a totally abstract work that remains abstract and geometric and very, very engaging. Also, look at the surface. Um, the, these are sculptures that are meant to age, to take on a very particular patina, and they're astonishingly intimate. Can I have the next, please? So here we get to the perfect notion of a vertical that's not a figure. And I mean, Look at, look at the one on the left, mahogany and steel. The one on the right, painted bronze and rosewood. 
This sense of combining materials set Beverly apart from minimalism. She, she went her own way. She took what she needed, but she was very confident. And to some extent, these come out of her drawings, which um, were kind of astonishing. And can we have the next, please? Again, bronze and rosewood, oil painted steel. This is, this is just going her own way, being an abstractionist, um, creating work, which to some extent, she liked seeing grouped. And we will close with a group of similar pieces. Um, she had a show at Marlboro downtown on 25th Street a number of years ago. And, and part of this, the, 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 the rounded forms, they were all meant to relate to each other, to be like an environment. And that also set her apart. She was a unique sculptor. And as I said, at this point, she's going back and forth between New York and uh, other places in America and Toady. And it's this combination of experiences of looking at European art, looking at American art and going her own way. We, we should never forget, she, she, she studied to be a painter but she didn't study to be a sculptor. Can we have the next, please? And here, slightly larger pieces outside, um, absolutely astonishing, um, kind of amazing because these also come from uh, the, the, the tool series. And there's the two on the right are just, incredible in being stacked and being circular. Shouldn't a column be circular? But I think you could see they're, they're absolutely ravishing outdoors. May we have the next, please? So she doesn't, she doesn't give up on stainless steel. She makes a uh, uh, pieces similar to these in Corten steel. And Beverly was one of the first artists to work in Corten. Um, but I'm particularly intrigued by the work on the left, and you'll see it in a larger piece. Herbert Ferber used to complain that he would send his work to um, the fabrication shop. And because these places were so used to working with minimalist sculptures that they, they made the edges um, conform. They made everything regular. But look in, the, look in the left and look at that passage that is so roughed up. Um, that was never a problem for Beverly Pepper. What she did was intentional and it wasn't the fabrication shop that, 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 that completed her work, she completed the work. Again, look how you see through the sculptures and that is um, um, a unique quality of her work. Can we have the next two? So here's one of the core 10 pieces. Another one is outside the hospital on uh, 2nd Avenue and uh, 65th Street. So it, uh, it, it, it's an urban piece and also um, obviously a, a, a piece that's comfortable with mother nature. Again, 
Look at how she finishes the interior. That's a unique quality that she brings to her work, that she's the boss, not um, the foundry. Can we, I also love the scene. And so here you see a group of sculptures all together. And it's, it's kind of amazing. In the current show at Marlboro downtown, you kind of wander among four uprights. And it's, it's like, a, you can't quite play, play hide and seek, but you can walk around, through, inside, outside. Um, and I think the sense of the verticality and the, the, the decided abstraction is part of her uniqueness. So I don't know, Jory, what do you think? Oh, I thought that was amazing. Um, I, I'm intrigued by the one of the many things, but the most recent thing that you just said, which is as with these pieces, the fact that you can walk inside and outside and around and through, it's not usually something that you say about a sculpture. It's something that you say about a temple. You say it about certain kinds of sacred spaces, that there's an inside and an outside. And that goes all the way back to the very first piece that you showed uh, the wood with the very pronounced indication of an inside of the uh, where the uh, where the metal is, and then the outside where the wood is, and then that the fact that you indicated that every single sculpture is about um, seeing through made me think about the ways in which she uses sculptures to sh make you see past the sculpture, around the sculpture, um, at everything else. So that there's one in James's um, um, uh, show there, which is a, one of these verticals that has a little hole in it that you sort of go up to and look through. It's the size of your eye you go, and it compels you to go put your eye up against the eye of the sculpture. Why? Because she wants you to use the sculpture to look at something else. And um, that's a very unique aspect of mom's work, which you, meant you went to again and again. Um, she wants you to see in this polished stainless steel, she wants you to see all those seasons you mentioned, but also in that incredible one that's outside there, you're looking at sky and ground and trees and gravel. And each piece of the sculpture is like a collage of different aspects of the natural world. And as you move around that piece, what's astonishing is that Suddenly the piece that was sky turns in the trees, the piece that was, um, you know, trees turns into, it turns into uh, water. Um, you're completely right about as the weather changes and as the, when it rains on those sculptures, it's phenomenal because you start watching the rain redoubled coming in at different angles on it. So it's thrilling. But what I've always loved about them is that you can't see yourself. Here's a, a specu, a mirror. And mom's intentions, are always about look, using the sculpture to look at something else. It's never about losing, using the sculpture to look at the sculpture alone. Obviously, you have to look at the sculpture to look at something else, but that's why so many of these, when you showed them outside, Phyllis, they had shadows. And what does that mean? It means that in two seconds, the sculpture is gonna be different. Those incredible webs, which I loved what you talked about, the verticality as a figure, horizontality as a landscape. Well, watch this, we're just gonna make motion, which is what the natural world is. And you, talked about you know fences laden with snow the way they reveal themselves in spring is in this sort of collapsed state but it's also the way brambles grow I mean nature actually is not interested in the vertical and the horizontal it gives us space-time axes in order to do everything else the diagonal being what you so brilliantly pointed out but what I really love about the the the, the mirror image sculptures that that you were focusing on is the fact that um, it's really hard to be narcissist, to be narcissistic, as they you want the word being derived from narcissist, looking at his own face in the pool of water and falling in love with it and drowning. You can't drown in your selfhood in mom sculptures because they don't give you back a sense of selfhood. They're not about you. They're about the world. So that those, those web sculptures, the beautiful black shadows on the ground, which are almost as real in terms of materia as 
the, the steel, the black painted steel, um, they will move in a minute. They will move in another minute. They will disappear when the cloud cover comes. They will return. And that sculpture keeps altering itself because it wants you to look at what? At the passage of time. It wants you to look at, at uh, the fact that time is not static, that things are constantly changing. So what, does this, what is the subject of her sculptures? Ultimately change. You know, this has changed. The, the light just changed on this piece. So you can, but that will happen indoors or outdoors because as you move around a sculpture of mom's indoors, um, you, it just keeps it keeps changing its nature, and many sculptures have a sculptures have a front and back and a good view and a bad view and a, and this idea that you have about the, the wanting to be among the sculptures or having the sculptures you know indicate something else is really you'd have to say that she had a very very early environmentalist imagination because the sculptures are in service of. You know, when I hadn't noticed until you pointed it out all the different kinds of metals and woods that are mixed in these, and I didn't know that it was as original as you, you said it is. And I did, hadn't thought about the idea of yours that it, they, that combats minimalism. And you used the word baroques in the plural when you first spoke, which was really interesting because you had, you know, the Renaissance, but the baroques, which, and there are multiple baroque periods. And I started thinking about the ways in which, you know, these, you know, point to the non self to deep time, to geologic time, to earth, air, and sky, to antiquity. And, you know, they are what will carry us into the future. If you dug these up, any of the sculptures, you know, long when we're long gone, you wonder, you dug them up out of the rubble and you thought, who were these humans? I think that these sculptures would give you a really clear um, and maybe more optimistic answer that the humans might have been people who worshiped the world. Or the earth and I just think it's it's really great that you pointed all those things out thank you um Jory do you remember much about going to Angkor Wat I mean you weren't you were you weren't even a teenager I was 10 yeah and yeah, mom took me out of school for nine months um, yeah she took you out of school for nine months oh it took nine months to do the trip we did um she uh we we flew to, um, we had to fly to the US to, to do the trip for some reason. I had not otherwise not been in the US um, because I was raised in Italy. And we, we flew from Pan Am, from San Francisco to Hawaii where we had to ch change and wait to then fly to uh, Japan, which was the first stop. And in Hawaii, mom did, looking at these, it's kind of miraculous. Mom bought the biggest totem pole you've ever seen in your life in a gift shop in Hawaii, okay, and she had no money and she was just crazy, okay, but she bought this and it was, had it shipped to Genoa. And, you know, a year later, when it arrived in Genoa, she just said they had the wrong person. It wasn't intended for her. And she declined delivery of the sculpture because she knew it was gonna be awful. Okay, She knew it was just a moment, but she was really admired the vertical totem pole. Then we flew to Japan and in, my, in Japan, mom, um, uh, put me in flower arranging school. And she sent me to learn to, to be with the pearl divers in Osaka to learn how to dive for pearls at the age of 10. But mom went to study how to make um, wood blocks and how to do, you know, carve wood and how to make prints. And she got obsessed with Japanese paper and brought a lot of it back to Italy. So there she started shipping home paper. Um, she learned an enormous amount from, uh, from the minimalism in mom that does exist. She learned, I believe, in that part of the trip in Japan. Um, then we went to Cambodia and to, um, and to uh, India. And uh, the India trip was very complicated. She wanted to, my mother was immersive. She wanted to be in every experience. So when we went to um, Benares, where the, you know, the, the river that flows through Benares, um, is the river where all of the funeral pyres are and where you know the dead are you know once they're burned their ashes fall into the river and people wade out into the river and uh, are among the dead well you know i was 10 and mom was like we're doing this okay out we go into the river okay for hours not like for like a little tiny try it for five minutes it's like we're having the full experience the full funeral um and uh, it was like that everywhere we went to to nepal 
if it had been up to mom, we would have had to climb the whole of the Himalayas. Luckily, I was 10 years old and I couldn't quite handle it. But she looked at art everywhere. She was influenced a lot by Indian art. Um, she's looked at a lot of archaic Indian art and very early Indian art. Um, she was interested by the Thousand Buddha Wall, which is a thing that really influenced her, I think, much more than people think. So all of what you see in these pieces comes from all of these cultures, in addition to addition, American culture, industrial culture, the from working in factories. The last late part of the trip involved going to Cambodia and um, to uh, Angkor Wat. And um, when we were in Angkor Wat, we were in a, the only hotel then there and it was only half built. And it was the only classic, you know, Evelyn Wall, British couple there, the mother with her with her 50 year old son. And, uh, and mom made us go day after day after day into the temples of Angkor Wat. And it, it's, I hate to say this to, you know, reveals how long ago this was. We were the only people in there. It was us, a guide and monkeys, so many monkeys, the shrieking of monkeys. And mom would ha had to go and be, I mean, once you've seen quite a few dozen temples with gigantic banyan trees, the temples are very, geometric and they are often filled with the illusion of doors opening within doors within doors so you see space and then these gigantic trees have taken them into their uh, growth structure um, so that it's not just that the roots move across the ground but the trees hold the entire uh, civilized construction of the temple and the trees have done that over such a long period that you know you can't tell whether the human or the natural is it dominates in what you're looking at. And she was overwhelmed. She wept. She went back every day. She went back on her own. Um, and something about a place of worship, a temple, um, a force of nature so great that it looks like electric currents across the ground driving up towards the sky. So it's phonic. These trees, you know, their roots go down. Mom was very obsessed with the fact that the core of the earth is metal, molten metal. And she thought about it all the time. And she was obsessed with what clouds were doing all the time. And part of me, I realized in that moment there that what you would see if you looked up through the banyan trees, because there were so many monkeys, you would have to look up, you'd see clouds, and then you'd feel these huge roots going down. And that feeling that mom experienced all the time and talked about all the time, she would say when we're standing on the earth, you realize the, the core of this thing, can you feel the, I was a child, can you feel the core of the earth? Can you feel the core? And, you know, I, I say to myself, these, I just look at this little group on the screen here, you feel them rising up. If you imagine below that floor down to the core of the earth, these are rising up out of it. And I have drawings of all of the sculptures of this period. They were in a way all going to be parts of one temple that she tried to draw. You know, these were all going to be sort of, she has a circular drawing in which she put them all together, just as you say, Phyllis, but in a circle, like a temple of the Vestal Virgins in Rome. And these were the pillars for the temple. So temple and tree and land and art and civilization, it all started for her there. That's why she couldn't be a two-dimensional artist any longer. She had to work in the third dimension because the sacred involves entering. That's what you were just saying about the inside and the outside. Wow. I, I, one of the greatest, one of the greatest shows I ever saw was at the National Gallery of Art, and it was sculpture from Cambodia, and it was from that amazing museum in Paris, where I've been, but whose name I can't remember at this moment, but you also saw on all of these temples, these astonishing figures. Phyllis, one of the things that Jory had said about these messengers, which we're looking at on the screen, is that they would transmit, um, they would communicate with one world and another. And that notion really intrigues me that there's sort of like a pole, like an axis that transmits either from the subterranean or from another world. Jory, um, is that something you wanna elaborate on or Phyllis? Well, James, I mean, uh, Jory can say something, but you have to remember that, uh, I belong to, but obviously Beverly belongs to the world of 2001. And everyone was changed by that astonishing ending of 2001, that upright and the monkeys. Wait, what are you saying? 2001, the movie 2001. 
Yeah, well, what I was just going to finish what I was saying, which is that when you said the figures carved on those in, in Angkor Wat, we were among, you know, when you look at mom's social realist drawings that she was, by the way, on that trip is, if you look at 1960 and the drawings are of people, you know, especially in India, if you're in Benares, if you're in Nepal and you're in markets, you're in places that are crowded. So she drew large groups of figures and then she would abstract certain parts of them. And I would begin to see even as a child that those were the gnarly roots of the, of the uh, banyan tree. So that the groups of people became the roots of civilization because communities became, she, she stopped making individuals and she stopped doing, started doing drawings of groups of people. And at that moved to you know, the multi parts that end up being sculpture, but they also moved to the feeling of what roots are and what a community is. And I think that um, you were mentioning that before that the vertical, the, how often these are without a figure they're not re referencing a figure and how often, you know, people will say, um, it went away, it's like it, the, uh, the Giacometti or whatever. And it's absolutely not that, okay? She's not referencing the figure and she's not letting you see yourself in the, in the stainless steel because she's referencing, if you will, the community. The community, the root structure, all of us have been reading about fungi and how they hold the world together and they have vast intelligence and they move among root structures between trees and how trees talk to each other. My mother knew this all. She talked about it all the time. She was convinced because she was, people don't know this, but she was in, she loved to go out in her garden and prune things so that they could grow. So she spent a lot of time with these little shears when she, outside of her studio, there would be things clinging to the walls and she would go prune all the bushes to see what else would come. And her feeling that she would say to me, these have intelligence, these have such enormous intelligence. She says, they're communicating with each other. And this is long before, you know, people thought that, that nature was intelligent. So part of, you look at this group of, of messengers here and you realize these things are in a, in a kind of forest, but they're also in communication with each other. If you move among these, you know, like the things that change with the passage of time or the passage of the seasons, everything changes every time you move in their midst. Wow. I thought people might want to see these two pictures from your trip, Jory. Yeah, those are the roots, look at those. So yeah. you can actually see a theme that I think is really evident throughout the work, which is about um, the archeological artifact that these look like they might be Etruscan tools or objects that are uncovered, but that nature is always there to subsume civilization. Um, these roots are going right into these sculptures and they're actually starting to tear it down. I think that's a really interesting point with your mother's work, Jory, what do you think? You mean in Angkor Wat? At Angkor Wat. Yeah, well, you know, um, in the battle between what survives, What's interesting about Angkor Wat is that Angkor Wat survived, okay? But the message there is about, you know, the force is with the roots, okay? The force is with the trees, but the ambition of the human to not just worship in a grove in the Roman sense, which is what mom would have witnessed a great deal of, the idea of worshiping in nature. Um, this is a, a very interesting place because you insert really complicated structures and as Phyllis points out structures with beautiful carvings on them in the midst of trees that you know since you know those trees so well you both know how elaborate they are how gnarly they are and how fast they're going to grow over everything they're almost like a like a vine okay but they're very sturdy and so this idea of where is the human located in this particular sense of temporality because we know the buildings will eventually disappear and we know that the trees will eventually survive because the trees will give rise to other trees and the buildings will not give rise to other buildings. One of them is alive. So what does it mean if you're making art? Are you in the non-alive category or are you in a different kind of alive category? And you know, the, the idea that you know, there's a living force driving through the banyan trees and what is driving through the temples that are encrusted in them like barnacles? Well, human imagination, desire and the desire to worship. You know, these are temples. They're put in the midst of these trees so that people could go and be. It's the same way that we feel about those gigantic sequoias that are burning now and why we want to go stand inside them. You know, they are 
thousands of years old. They're among the oldest creatures on earth. You know, we've stopped calling them just trees and we call them creatures, okay? And there, and we, to be inside them in their midst, why do we have, you know, why do we feel that we, we care about climate change, which mom was, you know, very early on informed about and worried about, although she could not have imagined the catastrophe that we face now. Um, but why would we care about the natural world except that it will go on? And we have these temporal frames that are short. In other words, isn't it exciting to have only 90 years and to know that you're in the presence of something that has that is it was built 3,000 years ago or that's gonna live for 3,000 years or 6,000 years as a tree or 12,000? Um, you know, isn't it exciting to be part of an arc where you are not the biggest thing, i.e. I see myself in the reflection, but rather the thing that disappears and what is there remains. And uh, so this part of mom's, and it's not just that she withdrew from cities and she went to work in nature and in Italy and from a, in a different culture, but you know, she had a, you know, I have many of her journals and her relationship to, you know, to um, what it was to, to, to live a life among people and forget that the life among the rest of it. I mean, my mother loved animals in a way that was crazy. I mean, all of us who know how much she loved her dogs, you know, also remember that she loved every mouse that came in the house, every, you know, every bird that arrived. And, you know, she just loved anything that was evidence of a force that's not us. And so she, she didn't, the, the ego was not her thing. The fact that she, I can put it here, we're recording it. You know, people were, there was misogyny that my mother encountered that she probably wouldn't encounter as much today. But when she was coming along, a powerful woman sculptor, um, Phyllis pointed out that she made small, medium, large, very large. My mother made gigantic. My mother made amphi sculptures, you know, things that took up, you know, miles of earth. And she competed for all those commissions, um, predominantly with the major male sculptors of her era, because you know women were not competing for the uh, you know the 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 the, the Smithson uh, or other kind of land art. And if you look up at my mother's land art, which is another whole part of her work, you know where did she get that chutzpah? Where did she get that ambition? I mean, why didn't she just be, why wasn't she satisfied? And the fact that she could work at tiny scale, you showed some really small pieces. And what, what did she once tell me in the kitchen? I kept, I, she was, a name had been, a book had come out about her and it was called Monumenta. I said, why that word? Is it monuments? I said, Joy, monumental has to do with, not, doesn't have to do with scale. And I said, what do you mean? How can it not have to do with scale? And she ripped off a little piece of, of blue paper. I've never forgot this. And she just, taped it to the ledge of a bookshelf while she was cooking eggs. And she said, that's a monumental shape. I said, it's an inch high. She said, let me explain to you why it's monumental. And then she started talking about proportions and ratios and what it had to do. And this idea that she had that the smallest thing, that when, when she died, the thing closest to her was next to her bed. And it's a tiny little, um, um, sculpture, a prehistoric sculpture of a, a, a woman. Um, you know, one of those sort of um, Cro-Magnon kind of women, but tiny. And she used to think that that was one of the largest shapes that she knew because even though it was this big. And so this idea of what scale is feeds back into the idea of what is in terms of proportion, what is human ego in the scale of things, you know, versus, you know, it takes a lot of ego to make gigantic site sculpture the way my mother did it. You have to go into a factory, you have to get people you know, but this is an interesting story about my mother. And that is um, when she went into factories, she didn't like hierarchical structures. She didn't like the fact that each guy who worked on a piece, um, because in, in in when large pieces are fabricated, mom did not put her hands on the piece. The people delegated to work on the piece worked on the piece. She had the shop drawings uh, from which pieces are made. And But each person would just work on um, one piece for a little bit. And mom wanted them invested in the work. So she changed their work structure. And she said, everyone will work from start to finish on the piece, part of the sculpture that they're working on. Which of course made everyone much more excited to be working on it because they had the satisfaction of going from zero to finished 
on that piece. And the union got involved and the union said, our workers don't work this way. And the workers said, we would like to make other things this way. So she became an honorary member of the Boilermakers Union and they changed this particular way of working in a few factories where people would come to work for extra hours. They were so excited to be wanting to finish from start to finish. And, and that's where she, you know, her idea of how human society should work and her, her incredible politics you know, were sort of embedded in these, these kinds of experiences. My mother really loved working in factories, but she liked working with the guys in the factory. In other words, she wouldn't be, in her own studio, she was the maker. Most of the pieces you have here are very rare because my mother's hands have been on every one of those pieces in there, okay? But the gigantic cortens outside have to be fabricated by other people in the factory. No way my mother could be using that kind of equipment. Um, so it, you know, but every, if you look at the sculpture in front of us, she would have hand polished that piece of rosewood. I used to watch her for hours with her sanding paper, you know, before she started using grinders and she used to delegate tasks to me, believe me, it was a nightmare, but um, there, another memory. I wonder if we should have any questions, if anybody would like to uh, make a question in the chat. Um, for either Phyllis or for Jory. And um, otherwise, we're 50 minutes into it, although we obviously had a little bit of a glitch at the beginning. Um, I had shown a photograph just a second ago. It's kind of an astounding picture of a woman in the 1970s in a factory grinding away at metal. Could either of you talk about what this is like for a woman to have been working with metal this is the time of Virginia Slims. This is the time of women's rights. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? Phyllis. I don't know. I'm just I'm just thinking how Jory, you lucked out. Like the way her the way your grandmother used to uh, keep little Beverly out of school to go to Brooklyn Dodger games. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I think. You lucked out because you got to go on this nine month trip, which was a lot better than going to Brooklyn Dodger games and having these famous ball players touch your head for good luck. I this, think this is like a remarkable life that she led. And I want and, to know about what James asked, which is, you know, my mother and feminism, or my mother and whatever the idea of being female was, Virginia Slims is what. Uh, James used as a metaphor. Um, there's no doubt that my mother took that trip for a long time and took me out of school. I spent years wondering what she was up to. In other words, for those nine months, was she, she was in total crisis as an artist. I think she hadn't become the sculptor she was supposed to become. But as a result though, I have to say, um, when you make the, the, the wonderful dyad of Europe and the United States as two very competing influences in her work, um, Europe goes back a continuous culture for thousands of years. You know, you sit in a field in Umbria and which has been continuously cultivated for a thousand years. Okay, so that con continuity of time is very different from the very young country, which is the United States. Uh, you know, underneath a few layers, you know, you go to geologic time and the, the time of the great Native American cultures, which we of course genocided. So it's a very complicated uh, history, but you have to add the idea of uh, what she learned in India and Cambodia and Japan. Um, Japan remained an enormous influence on mom. Um, she went back many times and uh, she, uh, our house was covered with books of art that, you know, uh, and that involved these other cultures. So that the world is in these pieces, not just uh, that. Now, was that unusual in that period? I don't, I don't think so, but talk to me a bit more because I wasn't really there for it, about what it meant to be a woman in a factory. And, you know, th these pictures are kind of, um, what do we make now of mom's role, how she was seen and how she's seen now as a woman who uh, basically did a lot of man's work. When she first was sent to Pratt Institute, she wanted to take engineering classes, which were forbidden to women. Okay, so she couldn't take active engineering classes at Pratt. And she was called in by the Dean because she complained. And the Dean said to her, young lady, 
I don't know if you realize what the quota system is in this school, but you are Jewish and there are very, very few Jews in this school. So you must be incredibly gifted to have even gotten into here, but don't push your luck. You can't take an engineering class because you're a woman. And that was probably, knowing my mother, that was probably like, man, engineering, that's what I'm aiming for. And this was long before anything, okay? This is a woman in her 20s. But, um, but that's unimaginable. Imagine today where you're being told, let alone the anti-Semitism, imagine telling a young woman she can't take an engineering class because she's a girl. How does that, how does that? Yeah, no, when I was in, when I was in high school, the, we had to take cooking while the guys got to take shop. I mean, that, that's what the world was like. Well, mom did do the engineering and she did work with Les Robinson, who was the engineer um, of many large structures in the United States, a legendary engineer. Um, and for whom mom made that famous piece that you have outside there. Um, Les died um, recently, unfortunately, but and he was her beloved go-to engineer when she needed to get an actual engineer to do what were her engineering solutions. But she was, she would cook without measuring cups. And she wrote five cookbooks when, you know, she was, she didn't get a degree from Pratt because she left. So when she arrived in Europe, she went to the Cordon Bleu just to have a degree, as she put it. She wanted a degree in something. But she also, because we had no money, she wrote five cookbooks because she figured out that every time you write a cookbook, they have to pay someone to test all the recipes. And if she tested the recipes, she'd get food paid for for 10 months. So, you know, so, but she never measured things when she was cooking, which drove everyone nuts because it would just be like, you know, whatever she was doing. And I think she did her engineering um, pretty much on her own, except when she had to consult someone like Les. That sculpture, that stainless steel that James has outside there is one of her great masterpieces. And you know, that's why it went to the person she loved and admired above all others in terms of you know, how he helped her understand how things hold together, which is what engineering is. I think that was the part of the magic of your mom. I remember I once brought a roast chicken down to uh, Thomas Street and she did something to it. And I never, I still, I, to this day, I can't figure out what she did to it, but it was delicious. She just could transform things magically. Well, I know we're running out of time, but one time when I was very little and my mother was in that full sort of roam late at night when after the war, when people would just come and stay forever if there was enough white wine, um, and everyone had eaten snails, escargot, and they wanted more. So I went, I followed my mom into the kitchen and I said, there are no more. And she said, don't worry. And she just took a ton of mushrooms she had in the refrigerator, um, took the, the caps off and just boiled them really quickly. And then she stuffed all the mushrooms inside the shells and just put more garlic and pesto sauce on them and took them back out and everybody ate what they thought were um, the, uh, you know, she had no, they had no money, but she had imagination. And she yeah. knew the magic. A kitchen is magic. A foundry is magic. A studio is magic. Whenever you take metal, metal is one of the, those, we have gods be, that are represent different metals because metals were considered to be some of the most magical instruments. And of course the Smithy gods, the Hephaestus, the, the different gods of, of uh, that of metalworking are some of the most important gods in the Greek and Roman pantheon because they were able to transform one element into another. It's one thing to carve stone. It's another thing to melt metal and turn it into something altogether different. Behind James there is a piece of metal that's, you know, completely, or, or yeah, there they are, metal. I thought that maybe we'd conclude with this. Um, I like the idea that Beverly Pepper was like a sorcerer that she could put things together in ways that other people couldn't see. Um, I love that in this show, you see relationships between really about um, almost 60 years of work, 55 years of work. And you see it from the very, very earliest through some of the latest works. I'd like to thank both of you for being with us today. Uh, we literally could go on for a day talking about Beverly Pepper. I know we have the time constraint. Um, we will be posting this. We're going to um, 
probably retape the beginning. So we'll have a really an excellent presentation by Phyllis. And we'll also have the videos of um, the exhibition on our site, as well as all the pictures. We understand that not everybody can see it. Um, one quick aside, we will be showing at the ADAA the first week in November, and we're gonna have probably about five or six Beverly Peppers in that show, um, which is gonna be really beautiful. It's called Solitary Wave. And we're gonna have the entire group of stainless steel pieces at the Dallas Art Fair the second week in November. Then everything or most everything will come back. We'll reassemble the show for those who can visit. So thank everybody uh, for joining us. Phyllis, Jory, thank you again. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Jory. That was fascinating.